Sí. Ok, okay gracias. Gracias. Okay, we'll be the third one. So first you, Maria. Yes. And, and the other person is not coming. Yes. Okay. This one. Ah, oh yes, okay, okay, yes, okay. Okay, so good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, morning's uh, second panel sessions. Uh, this one is titled uh, Transculturality, Postcoloniality and Resistance, and I have the honor to be the chair. Uh, so I will present myself first and then my fellows from this table. Okay, so I am uh, Mariana Bonfarini. I hold a PhD from the University of Sao Paulo, and I was research fellow at the National University of Ireland, Maynooth. I teach at the Federal University of Rondonópolis in Mato Grosso, Brazil, and I am the head of the Brazilian Association of Irish Studies and researcher at the William Butler Chair, William Butler Yates Chair of Irish Studies. And I have researched and published extensively on casement. Okay, so the title of my talk is uh, Roger Casement's Ghost, Transnationalism and Transculturality in Ulysses by James Joyce. So I begin with this epigraph from Mark Twain's King Leopold's soliloquy as it conveys the violence or the butchery behind the three C's of colonial practice, uh, civilization, commerce, and conversion in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The region began to be explored by, in, by Britain with Henry Morton Stanley by 1878, uh, who, had, who by 17, 1878 had opened the heart of Africa to Europe. Stanley went on to write about the limitless opportunities of, uh, for England to explore the lands he had discovered. Although England was not initially enthusiastic about investing in Africa, King Leopold II hired Stanley. As disputes between uh, colonies escalated, the 1885 Berlin Conference legitimized the partition of Africa and recognized the Congo Free State. Before long, rumors of atrocities committed against the native rubber collectors during the height of the, of the rubber boom in Leopold's Free State began to spread across Europe. As a result, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs convened a British Commission of Inquiry and uh, Roger Casement, born in Dublin, 1864, then counsel in Boma, confirmed administrative irregularities. The case of the Congo Free State is significant as it is one in which, as it is one of the first in which human rights violations have been conformed and reported. Casement later became consul in Brazil and investigated atrocities in the Peruvian Amazon. Casement was acclaimed for the authorship of the Congo Report in 1904 and then the Amazon Report in uh, 1912, uh, which describe atrocities committed against men, women, and children who were flogged had their limbs amputated and suffered from starvation. After witnessing this horror, Casement joined the cause of the Irish independence and sought support for, uh, sought German support at the outbreak of World War I. He returned to Ireland on 21st April and was arrested and taken to the Tower of London. During his trial for treason, personal diaries of homosexual content, the Black Diaries were found by the British Home Office. Um, Casement's trial was to have a propaganda effect, yet, as Angus Mitchell affirms, in death, Casement proved even more of an irritant to the authorities than he had proved in life. 
This idea is also captured in the refrain of William Butler Yeats's illustrious poem, The Ghost of Roger Casement is Beating on the Door. Similar to Casement, uh, the writer James Joyce lived most of his life outside Ireland between Trieste, Zurich, and Paris, where he died in 1914. To think about Joyce in transcultural terms is, according to Karen Lawrence, to place him and his afterlife in a context uh, at once more global and more local, presenting him as at once more particularly Irish and more post-colonial. Still, according to Lawrence, as a cultural icon, Joyce provides an illuminating case for investigation since he occupies a borderline position, canonical and modernist, as well as an Irish writer from colonial and post-colonial periods. In this regard, Frederick Jameson conceives of Joyce as coexisting between two in incommensurable realities. Um, of the metropolis and of the colony simultaneously. Jameson renders Ulysses a novel produced in a context which reproduces, and I quote, the appearance of first world realities and social relationships, but whose underlying structure is in fact much closer to that of colonized daily life, end quote. Both Casement and Joyce have occupied ambivalent positions. Casement as a British Council slash Irish revolutionary and Joyce as being repositioned as an Irish writer. Furthermore, since both had uh, to leave Ireland, albeit for different reasons, Casement spent his life embracing and learning the categories of Irish life while Joyce spent his life resisting them. Bearing in mind these points of convergence, I argue that the reference to the Congo atrocities in the Cyclops episode of Ulysses reveals a recognition of the importance of Casement as a transnational figure within Irish history. One of the reasons for this is that issues involving nation and identity lay at the heart of the Cyclops episode, especially when we consider the fact that the protagonist, Leopold Bloom, is constantly required to affirm his Irish identity as an Irishman. As a foil narrative, Casement, at once a believer in empire, is also constantly affirming his Irishness and loyalty to Ireland. In the Cyclops episode, there, is a, there are a few passages that pave the way for the mention of Casement and his Congo investigation. First, there is a reference to capital punishment and uh, after a hangman's letter is read out, which leads to Bloom's questioning the deterring effects of hanging before the subject turns to na nation and identity. So persecution, says he, all the history of the world is full of it, perpetuating national hatred among nations. But do you know what a, a nation means, says John Wise? Yes, says Bloom. What is it? A nation, says Bloom. A nation is the same people living in the same place or also living in different places. What is your nation, if I may ask, says a citizen. Ireland, says Bloom. I was born here, Ireland, and I, be I belong to a race too, says Bloom, that is hated and persecuted. Also now, this very moment, this very instant, robbed, plundered, insulted, persecuted. To Bloom, the idea of belonging is transnational and inclusive. He is both Irish and a Jew. According to Patricia Clavin, transnationalism, despite its early identification with transfer of money and goods, is, the, is first and foremost about people, the social space they inhabit, the networks they form, the ideas they exchange. Uh, I argue uh, all those scholars have connected this excerpt uh, with Casement's speech from the doc. I argue that there are echoes of it in other pieces written by Casement as well, such as this letter uh, Casement wrote from Santos to his friend, the historian Alice Stopford Green. Finally, when up in those Congo lonely forests, I found myself the incorrigible Irishman. I realized that I was looking at this tragedy with the eyes of another race, of a people once hunted themselves. And I said to myself, then far up the Lulongo River, that I would do my part as an Irishman wherever it might, le it might lead me personally.
To Casement, the idea of nation is expanded as he relates the ills of imperialism in the Congo to the hunting of his own people. In Ulysses, as Bloom uh, broadens the idea of nation to the people who are being persecuted elsewhere, he is not only referring to the persecution of Jews, which was in fact taking place in Ireland, but to injustice by and large. This idea is even clearer when J.J. Omoloi brings Casement into the discussion. Uh, well, says J.J., if they're any worse than those Belgians in the Congo Free State, they must be bad. Did you read that report by a man? What's this? His name is Casement, says the citizen. He's an Irishman. Yes, that's the man. I know where he's gone, says Lenham, cracking his fingers. Who, says I? Bloom, says he. The courthouse is a blind. So here, if we exchange Bloom for Casement, we read, Who, says I? Casement, says he. The courthouse is a blind. So, uh, for if we think about this uh, for a moment, one becomes the other. There is an overlap between Bloom and Casement. So J.J. Omoloi and the citizen, by, allude, by alluding to the exploitation of the natives in the Congo Free State to obtain the red rubber, uh, Omoloi refers specifically to Casement's investigation in 1903, which led to the publication of his report as an official blue book in 1904, the, the year in which the story of Ulysses takes place. Yet by 1922, when Ulysses was in fact published, Casement had been long forgotten and lay among convicted murders and criminals in Pentonville in London. So although Casement would have been known in 1904, by 1922, he was an already an abject memory in England, Ireland, and South America. In Joyce's famous essay, Ireland, Island of Saints and Sages, Joyce deconstructs the idea of a pure Irish identity for he claims, and I quote, what race or what language can boast of being pure today, end quote. Thus, Joyce's choice to include Casement and the Congo atrocities in Ulysses is the outcome of his transnationalism. If Joyce wrote to Ulysses, and I quote, to give a picture of Dublin so complete that if it one day suddenly disappeared from the earth, it could be reconstructed by my book, end quote. This means that if Casement is written in the novel, it is because the nation that Joyce imagines has Casement's ghost knocking on its door. So to conclude, the transnational and transcultural connections that stem from Ulysses and from Casement's writings bring to the fore the main motivations of imperial practice. Henry Morton Stanley was the fir first Englishman to see market opportunity in the naked bodies of the, na of the Africans. And Leopold II turned the heart of darkness into his backyard. Also, the Congo atrocities reported by Casement and written into Joyce's Ulysses confirmed that history is connected, circular, and transnational. Thank you. Okay, so now uh, I have the pleasure to introduce our second speaker. Uh, Michelle Alvarenga is a lecturer in American and Anglo-Irish literature at the University of Brasilia and a PhD candidate in Irish literature at the University of Sao Paulo. She is currently researching the representation of history and violence in Irish contemporary theater and is very interested in post-colonial studies. So Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, is my presentation on already? Yes, thank you. Okay, good morning. Good afternoon, actually. No. <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure to be joining you today for this panel. Um, 
I would like to start by acknowledging that I am attending this conference today due to the financial support received by the Brazilian Association of Irish Studies through the ESP grant. Uh, the paper I'm about to present reflects on the similar strategies used, so I'll just come back a moment for the title, um, uh, on the similar strategies used in the process of decolonization of culture in Ireland and Brazil during the Irish revival and the Brazilian anthropophagic movement, the first steps towards the consolidation of these countries' modernist movements. And this is why both are addressed as early modernist, move, early modernist movements in this work. My, pro my proposal is to demonstrate how in both countries, the artists and writers involved used indigenous and primitive sources to reflect on the idea of nation and of national identity. You might all be familiar with Edmund Spencer's uh, 1596, A View of the Present State of Ireland, in which he portrays the Irish as an evil, barbarous and savage race. He justifies the need for the ongoing English rule and domination over Ireland and its people who had to be civilized. In Brazil, we, had, we also had an equally hideous representation of our native peoples. In Hans Staden's book entitled, and then we have to read together, the story and description of a country of wild, naked, grim, man-eating people in the New World America which was extremely popular, by the way, in the 16th century. He depicts one of Brazil's biggest indigenous ethnicities, the Tupinambas, as barbarous cannibals with drawings included. And these are the drawings from his book, okay? When the European nations began their exploration of the world through colonization, they began to build their empires economically, politically, and epistemologically. One of the most important things they needed was to build a justification for the actions they were performing in the newfound lands. And both Spencer and Staden provided the English and Portuguese crowns with what they needed to launch their civilizing expeditions. Franz Fanon states that the manichaeism of the colonial structure transforms the colonial subject into a kind of quintessence of evil. And I believe that Spencer's definition of the Irish and Staden's representation of the indigenous people do it quite well. In the Brazilian case, the Tupinamba ceremonies of anthropophagy were vilified as barbarous cannibalism. Whereas in the Irish case, even the natives beliefs in fairies and Celtic lore were seen as a savage aspect of their identities and culture. Um, Spencer focuses on the superstition of the Irish, for example, in a point of his essay and how they were transmitted through their bard songs. The Brazilian and Irish writers and artists from the early 20th century praised these cultural aspects as a genuine part of Brazilianity and Irishness. As a response to this smear built throughout centuries of foreign occupation and domination on their lands. This is what allows us to see the Celtic revival and the Brazilian anthropophagic movement comparatively. As Megan Quinley states, the literary revival shared many philosophical underpinnings with international modernism, particularly in its perception of history and the use of myth. Where the modernists turned to primitivism, African masks, poetry origins as a savage beating a, a drum in the jungle, the revivalists turned using similar new anthropological ideas to the local primitive uh, in the Irish speaking areas where the modernists turned to classical myth, revivalists turned to Celtic mythology. And this was exactly the same movement, one towards a country's pre-colonial past that the Brazilian early modernists adopted. They, however, looked back to the past, but kept moving forward, rescuing aspects of their culture that had been deliberately suppressed by the colonizers 
but acknowledge the colonial inheritances that all post-colonial nations have through Hebridism. During the revival, Irish myths and traditions were used simultaneously to embody past and present, for past and present Ireland, like in WB Yeats's and Lady Gregory's 1902 play Catherine Holden, or in Lady Gregory's 1907 play Der Vergila, which is based on the legend of Darmut and Grania. The importance of the Abbey Theatre established in 1904 and the assemble of writers and intellectuals around its conception creates this grouping of artists that is characteristic of other modernist groups such as London's Bloomsbury, Gertrude Stein's Paris Suarez, and Mario Enoso de Andrade's group responsible for the Week of Modern Arts in Sao Paulo in 1922. Aside from this, both groups were responsible for publishing magazines, aligning themselves with what modernists from other countries were doing. And while Brazil had two manifestos published, the Pau Brasil Manifest and the Anthropophagic Manifest, the revivalist intention acquired a manifesto-like quality, such as in Lady Gregory's letter, setting forth the necessity of the Irish literary theater arguing for, and I quote, that freedom to experiment, which is not found in theaters of England, a new movement in art, end of quote. Celtic lore was also represented in visual arts in, for example, Jack Butler Yeats's works. This, for instance, is a painting portraying the Armiud dying before Finn reaches him with the handful of water that could save his life. In the Brazilian modernist movement, more specifically after the Anthropophagic Manifest from 1928, the traditional culture that was denigrated by European colonists like Hans Staden is rescued to incorporate a significant part of Brazilian identity and culture, and also to provide the rupture and allow the experimentation with form that is typical of modernisms all over the world. Oslo de Andrade's phrase, and we did not, uh, uh, just a parenthesis, uh, recalling Dennis's uh, um, lecture earlier, if we had combined to do this, I don't think it would be so you know, precise, because the, the sentence is this. Oswald de Andrade's phrase, to pee or not to pee, that is the question. It is a sentence that gives prominence to the indigenous language, which is to pee, is spoken in colonial Brazil, appropriating Shakespeare's most famous quote. This explores the critical and conscious absorption, what the manifest called a critical swallowing of European culture that had been dominating Brazilian literature, music, arts, and add something local to it. European influence was seen as something inevitable in a culture formed upon different forms of domination and cultural anthropophagy meant choosing the European aspects, traces, or techniques that would contribute to Brazilian culture and use them critically, consciously, not merely copying it as it had been done before. A sort of cultural miscegenation which reflects the country's hybridism. As the Brazilian scholar Antonio Cândido states, there is a fundamental ambiguity in our culture, we Brazilian, that we are Latinos of European cultural heritage, but ethnically miscegenational, located in the tropics, influenced by primitive indigenous and African cultures. This ambiguity has always given a tone of embarrassment to particularistic statements, an issue generally solved by idealization. In this matter, the Indian was described as a possessor of European virtues, not anthropophagous at all, and customs, miscegenation, miscege miscegenation was ignored and the landscape was deprived of its extravagance. It is this local extravagance in all senses that the Brazilian early modernists bring in their art, 
a colorful and faithful representation of Brazilianity. Anthropophagy finds its way back through literature and visual arts. And its finest representation is Tarsila do Amaral's painting Abaporu, which coincidentally is part of the permanent collection of Malba Museum here in Buenos Aires. Abaporu means the man who eats men, the man who eats people. It is an indigenous word. It is a Tupi Guarani word. Uh, and according to the manifesto, only anthropophagy unites us socially, economically, and philosophically. And its representation states for the modernist act of deliberately maintaining certain aspects of European cultural influence in their art, reflecting the respect that the original Tupinamba ceremonies had. I didn't have time to explain exactly how they happened, but I think the quote is going to give you an idea. Darcy Ribeiro, one of Brazil's most respected anthropologists, states that these ceremonies, they were something like a sacred ritual in which by eating the flesh of the captive, the entire tribe would acquire this person's qualities and strength. Therefore, only those who are seen as honorable, capable, and brave would be sacrificed. They chose who they were going to engage in the ceremony. A coward, he writes, could not be eaten. Thus, that which is done in Europe and does not add or is not coherent with Brazilian reality is eliminated. But that which can aggregate and enrich our cultural manifestations should be maintained. The fact that the Irish revivalists produced their works in English, that Yeats and Singh managed to transmit Irishness through English, a language forcefully imposed on the Irish, and the Brazilian modernists accepted the inevitability of European influences in their art shows how both groups somehow acknowledge their hybridism. Both groups demonstrate how a return to a strictly pre-colonial praxis is not possible and already put forward a notion of being a people whose culture is what Homi Baba calls a culture in between, which is neither one nor the other. The Brazilian and the Irish experiences demonstrate how in these countries, the decolonization of the mind led to a different direction. The revivalists and the Brazilian early modernists were able to reinvent their culture epistemically through a new locus of enunciation. They produced works that explored the national without denying their inevitable colonial heritage. It was an elaboration close to what Baba denominates as a third term, a precondition for political, social, and cultural stability, uh, an instrument for translating the condition of a former colony. That reinforces what Edward Said uh, defines as the voyage in which constitutes an especially interesting variety of hybrid cultural work. And that it exists at all is a sign of adversarial internationalization in an age of continued imperial structures. No longer does the logos dwell exclusively as it were in London and Paris. No longer does history run unilaterally as Hegel believed from East to West, from South to North becoming more sophisticated and developed, less primitive and backward as it goes. Instead, the weapons of criticism have become part of the historical legacy of empire. Uh, Declan Kybert wrote that the Irish Renaissance is fascinating because, and I quote, the cultural revival preceded and in many ways enabled the political revolution that would follow. In spite of all the contradictions within the revival, its attempt to present Ireland and its folklore provided the beginning of a differentiation from the British that would culminate with the Easter Rising of 1916. In Ireland, cultural decolonization started before political independence was achieved. In some ways, the revival can be seen as a prelude to revolution. In Brazil, the idea of the critical swallowing postulated by 
this uh, early modernist would allow in the future incredible cultural manifestations that are hybrid, such as Bossa Nova, Tropicalia, or Cinema Novo, just to, to name a few. I would like to conclude by sharing that this investigation is aware of the complexity of the revival and of the revisionist discussions that have been done around it. In the same way that the Week of Modern Arts in Brazil, as well as its outcomes, is celebrated and critically looked at by Brazilian scholars. Both movements were led by wealthy and privileged intellectuals, by the powerful Anglo-Irish, and by the sons and daughters of the Brazilian coffee barons who were sent to be educated in Europe. And although there is no record of any correspondence between the Brazilian and Irish writers, and no register that they knew each other's works, it is very interesting to demonstrate how these two colonial subjects have had similar processes of cultural decolonization and how the Celtic revival and the Brazilian anthropophagic movement became important both for the artistic responses produced to endorse or to refute them for the establishment of flourishing substantial political and cultural changes throughout the 20th century. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Michele. Uh, okay, so our next speaker is uh, Diana Perez. No, sorry. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, Eliana. This one. Yes. Uh, Eliana? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, okay. So, uh, our next speaker is Eliana, Eliana Criado, uh, who got her degree as a teacher of English in 2015, and her BA degree as a researcher in 2021. Both degrees were granted by Universidad Nacional de Rio Cuatro, and currently she's finishing an MA program in English literature at the same institution. Her thesis is directed by Maria Graciela Eligi, a specialist in Irish studies. So Eliana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure being here with you. And before starting my presentation, I would like to say uh, to tell you that it's the initial state of my research for my master's degree. So results are not going to be shared today, but I would like to uh, talk about the historical context. Um, well, the, the, the literary works I have chosen for my for my final paper. So, well, my research is called From Rock to Riches, the Irish Female Migration to South America in the 19th century as represented in literature. As you know, by the beginning of the 19th century, Irish people motivated by the hard economic situation and the political turmoil in Ireland started a new life in different parts of the world. Some of them decided to emigrate to English speaking country like the USA or Australia, while others decided to move to the Caribbean or South America. Nevertheless, the phenomenon of migration is quite an unexplored issue, and especially Irish female migration to South America has not been thoroughly studied until recent times. Different sciences like anthropology and soci sociology have attempted to describe the motivations behind the resettlement of individuals in new places. Initially, Everett Lee proposed a comprehensive theory of migration in 1966, which proposed that each place has a set of positive and negative factors that attract people or repel them respectively. Later, a new concept to explain migration was coined, transnationalism. According to Schiller, the term transnationalism refers to, I quote, the process by which immigrants build social fields that link together the country of origins and the country of settlement. 
taking this definition into consideration, the 19th century exodus to South American countries like Argentina and Paraguay, and the relationship established between the Irish, the former country, Ireland, and the new countries will be analyzed in two literary pieces. The literary pieces are You Will Never Go Back by Caitlin Nevin and The Pleasures of Elias Lynch by Anne Wright. Oh, that is, no, 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 there is another one, sorry. Another, no, don't worry, don't worry. I will, I will, I will. So my research is motivated uh, by analyzing and, discover, uh, and describing how was the migration done to these new, to these new places. And I got different objectives, basically to explore uh, the lives of these migrant women in the new countries, to explore, to explore the process of settlement, how they did it, and the domestic life they carry out here as single female uh, and Irish women. Yes. So before... Um, after, after telling you this, I would like to concentrate in the corpus I have selected. The first one is uh, You Will Never Go Back or Nunca Regresarás by Anne Wright. This is a Victorian narrative. And basically I couldn't find the, um, the book cover in English because I think it's a quite old book. And in English it's quite uh, old fashioned. So new editions are no longer available. Yes, and the second one is a more recent one about, a, well, I would say a, an important or one of the most important figures, Irish, fe Irish figures in Paraguay, Eliza Lynch by Anne Wright. So to begin with, the novel You Will Never Go Back, as I said, is a Victorian narrative about the new lives of three Irish single women in Argentina, Catherine, Nancy, and Bessie. And far from the beginning, the readers are informed that they want to travel. Their main motivation to travel to Argentina is to become governess of wealthy families and earn money to be able to go back to the homeland as independent women. In addition to this, the memories of these women also show their initial perceptions about the new country, Argentina, and her new place of residence, Buenos Aires and the countryside, as well as portraying the creation of different types of relationship in the Irish community living in Argentina. On the other hand, The Pleasure of Elise Lynch by Anne Wright and published in 2002, is a historical narrative set in two different places, Paris and Paraguay during the 19th century. The main protagonist is Elise Lynch, Francisco Solano's Lopez mistress. The story begins in Paris, where a 19-year-old Eliza lives and met Francisco, who is on a tour through Europe. They fall in love, and she starts a new life in Paraguay, not only as his mistress, but also as the ruling empress who is despised by Lopez family and by the, and by the local aristocracy. In 1865, the War of the Triple Alliance starts and Lopez fights again, Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. And unfortunately for Eliza, her husband and her eldest son are killed. This event changes her life completely and she decided to return to Ireland. After devoting some time to the corpus, I would like to introduce the a historical context of the two novels. Yes, I will refer to the historical context in Ireland, in Argentina, and in Paraguay as well as a way of introducing this, um, well, the changes that were undergoing in these places and how they motivated the migration of these persons. Well, as it can be observed, both novels are set in the 19th century, a time of profound change in Ireland, and these changes may become a motivation for migration. We have four, diff we have four main events here, 
the Great Famine, the land reform, the fight for home rule, and finally the Easter Rising. The first of this event is the Great Famine, which lasted six years and marked profoundly the life of Irish peoples since the potato crop, a fundamental part in the diet of farmers became infected and caused the destruction of leaves and edible roots of the potato plant. Uh, it's important to say that the potato crop was fundamental in the, in the diet of Irish people. So this meant, uh, well, the death of millions of people. Even though the British government took certain measures in order to ease the situation, the government policies were ineffective and caused the death of 2 million people and the resettlement of 1 million Irish in different parts of the world, such as Australia, Canada, USA, and Argentina, among others. Even though this was one of the darkest moments in Irish history in a country characterized mainly by rural activity, the results of bad harvest caused several famines before and after the Great Famine. Taken into, consider taken into consideration that the majority of land was held by a small number of landlords who rented or leases the land to tenant farm, land reform was a central demand of political factions of the time. One of these political factions was the Agrarian League, founded in 1879 by Michael David and Charles Stuart Panel, whose main demand was primarily a reduction in rent, an increase in security of tenure, that is to say, a reduction in evictions, and the, the transfer of land ownership from landlords to tenants as a long-term goal. On the other hand, countries like Paraguay and Argentina were also undergoing certain political processes which attracted migration, immigration, sorry. To begin with, Argentina got its independence from Spain in 1816, uh, but this country retained some Irish migrants from the failed British invasions in 1807. These soldiers had formerly served the British army, but since their loyalty to the crown was not strong enough, some of them deserted the army and joined the natives. So when the peace was obtained, they stayed in Argentina as free citizens. In addition to this, the recently independent country lacked a, a reasonable workforce. And because of that, they took certain measures to promote Irish migration supported by British and Irish uh, merchants who had emigrated to South America as subordinated of the Spanish flag during colonial times. Then, during the Great Famine, Argentina was one of the destinations chosen by the Irish since, as explained by Edmundo Murray, I quote, many factors contributed to create the reputation of Argentina as a region where land acquisition was easier than the other places, particularly letters and news from early emigrants, newspapers, articles in English published in the British Isles and in Argentina, and travel handbooks. This is observed in Nevin's narrative. In this, in this story, the women are informed about Argentina as a place of opportunities by Maria Brady, who has been a governess to a wealthy South American family. And though she never expressly say so, everyone in Granars believed that she had made a quote, quite a fortune. Another important aspect to consider is the region where these women come from, namely Granars, a town located in the north of County Longford and in the heart of Ireland. According to Patrick McKinnon, the number from Westmeath and South Longford were to make up two thirds of the total of Irish emigrants to Argentina. 
In addition to this, women's departure from Ireland was conflicted. Not all, uh, was conflicting, not only because of the perception of betrayal for independence, but also because women were considered symbols of national territory, family, and identity. Even though initially non inheriting sons were the ones who left Ireland, then single women from families possessing some acres of land started their journey to Argentina. This is the case of Catherine and her cousin Bessie, who live in Ireland within the, the family state and under the authority of Catherine's brother Pat and her wife Mary, does not be independent. Also, Nancy lived with her father and stepmother. When these three women informed the decision to emigrate to Argentina, the families at first rejected the decision. And father, uh, and I quote, father was vexed and I tried to reason and tried to reason with us and called Father Molo to make his reverence reason with us. Nevertheless, the same financial expectation as male immigrants are significant for women, and women would take jobs and earn money so as to be able to return to their homes. Unfortunately, we know that by the end of the narrative, they are not able to return to their homes, but uh, well, they, they start new lives here in Argentina. In the case of, uh, on the other hand, Paraguay became in the independent, uh, the became de facto independent from Spain in 1811 after removing the Spanish governor from office and installing a regency council of which the lawyer, Dr. Gaspar Rodriguez de Francia was the head of political feature. Paraguay independence was not immediately recognized by the British. Oh, here. There, sorry. But our independence was not immediately recognized by the British because it, was, it wasn't a, as an important station for the commerce of goods. So British and Irish merchants did not establish theirs and there were no measures to promote migration and foreign investment, and le at least from their size. Nevertheless, migration started in the 16th century when three members of the, the Society of Jesus, among them an Irish, Thomas Field, disembarked in Paraguay. Thomas Field was a religious missionary and he established a connection with Guanani people there. But the most important person in Paraguay is Eliza Lynch, a powerful figure of the time. And writes in Enright's novel, she, well, the, the, the story starts with a sexual encounter between Francisco and Eliza, who is later aware she's pregnant. And after some time el elapses, she's traveling to Paraguay. On her journey, the readers are informed about her life. She was born and lived in Ireland near the spa town of Milo until the age of 10, when the hunger, that is to say, the great famine, yes, I quote, when the hunger rang in, in the countryside obliged us to leave from the harbor at Quiznaunt. Yes, so from this passage, we know she's a survivor of the great famine and that her family relocated in order to avoid this situation. In addition to this, and with this I finish. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to this, we know that she has married and she has experienced the colonial and imperial enterprise by marrying a, Fre a French man who worked with the French forces in Algeria. Nevertheless, she had abandoned her husband and started a new life in Paris when he met Francisco. 
towards the towards the middle of the novel, we know that the initial welcoming in Paraguay was not a good one. The fam Lopez families reject her, and Eliza Lynch becomes known as La Licha or La Concubina Landesa, a figure equally loved and hated, which captivated local society with her eccentric behavior. Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, uh, Eliani and Michele for this panel. And uh, was wondering if we have time for maybe one question, Paula. One or two. <laughs> Let me call. Yes, Gabriela. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for the presentations. Uh, I have the opportunity to listen only to one, the last one. And I have a question um, based on your reading, do you see any similarities or differences between Catherine and Eliza that you can see, okay, these are some of the uh, characteristics of an Irish woman that it's a migrant. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a really good question. For me, I I am in love with the two women because they are so uh, so strong. Yes, they have to put up with with several difficulties from um well even before coming to Argentina and Paraguay respectively. Yes, they have been uh, under the uh, the well they have been uh, ruled by men. They have undergo the great famine. They have um been abandoned in a way by the family when coming here. So um, I think th that you can see the parallel between them because they have been, uh, they at least they have tried to establish a new life here. In the case of Catherine, she was able to do it. And in Eliza's case, unfortunately, when her husband died, she is no longer she doesn't she doesn't feel at home anymore so she's she's willing to return to ireland but i think yes that there are two strong women and fighting and trying to assimilate into a new country where they do not speak the language and facing some difficulties because of that Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comment? Okay, thank you. Thank you to the three of you for the wonderful panels. For given my own um, research interest, I'm a little bit more, I was a little bit more into the first two panels, but I did learn a lot from, from, from yours, so thank you. Um, so I just, I just have a comment. Uh, in, in both cases, uh, Michelle and Marianne, I, I could see that there's so much more there than what you actually um, exposed. I, I could see all the intricacies and there were a lot of threads. Um, so uh, just a couple of comments and maybe if, if you want to have a response. In the case of Marianne, um, I was thinking that it does indeed take a post-colonial uh, perspective from a colonized uh, uh, oriented reader, so to speak, to read Joyce in the way in which you have read it. And that, and that, of course, you have Casemen there, but of course you have so many other questions, but I'd really enjoy the way in which you connected uh, there, that. So it really links, I think, with my idea on how Joyce can be read and how it was not read uh, uh, from the post-colonial perspective until quite late. Uh, and, and the Joyce industry reduced it to a sort of Anglo, uh, Irish canonical modernist writer, but the, the way in which you have read it actually brings to the forefront that there is that other choice that has always been there. Exactly. Uh, and I think one of the earliest uh, post-colonial readers of Joyce were the Cubans, but that, that's another story. I have, I have actually done work on that, but it really links with what, you, what, you, what you're doing there. So thank you for that. And then for, for um, Marie, uh, Michelle, I was thinking, I, I was really interested in, in the way in which you read the revival and the um, the uh, and the Brazilian modernists, yes, which are you know well known. Uh, 
when you study modernism. But I was thinking to complicate things more, you might want to also establish connections, not only with the Irish literary revival, but with the uh, Irish modernists. Right, and, and the way in which primitivism sort of encompasses uh, a, a broader category that you could very obviously, I'm, I'm sure you've done it yourself, but I was just thinking that uh, that natural connection between the modernists is there, because again, uh, for a long time, modernism has been sort of frozen into a pantheon, uh, which does not necessarily uh, account for the variety. So um, just that. Thank you. Thank you to the three of you. Like yes, I would just like to say, Teresa, um, yesterday while I was uh, listening to your panel, you were saying how Joyce was so ironic about the story of writing uh, Dublin, of Dublin being recreated from Ulysses. And I was like, oh my goodness, what if he's being ironic when including casement into Ulysses? But then, no, right? So Actually, when this began with the chairs, uh, with the course that we, uh, with the joint chairs course, and then I was, I, I have been researching the Congo and then I suddenly realized this and I was like, oh my goodness, I think that this whole chapter might be about casement, <laughs> you know, at the backstage and, and the fact that Joyce includes casement in his story is a political statement in itself. So, so it's really, I find it really interesting. And there are many, many other threads that can. So thank you so much for your comment. Um, Teresa, thank you for, for bringing that forward. Um, I try to be very concise because 15 minutes, I, I, anthropophagy is a strong word. I'm usually very careful when I talk about this to, to audiences who are not familiar with the movement. Uh, but yes, uh, and the connections between Brazilian, uh, uh, not just modernism, because I think that the, the struggle and the strategies, they are so similar because they were somehow trying to resist the same influence. Because we became, when Brazil became independent, we kind of uh, refuted Portugal, but then we had France and England as a model. So we just changed, you know, we don't want anything to do with the Portuguese anymore. Now let's see what the French are doing and let's do and Brazil, as Argentina and pretty much the entire Latin America, we were um, uh, we had a lot of influences from England, economically, politically, but also culturally. So there are certain strategies of resistance, even in terms of language, that can approximate the writers. And it's interesting because Joyce arrived quite early in Brazil too. And that we have, I mean, registers of these first group of modernist reading joys. And we have within the Brazilian modernist movement, I mean, the later uh, uh, generation, João Guimarães Rosa, that I don't know if you know, but he's very Joycean in form and language. And there are uh, many approximations, fruitful approximations that we can make. So it's just, I mean, a first step. And, and yet, I mean, it's, it's conjecture because Yes, uh, at least in this early, early moment, uh, there is no register of, for example, them reading Yates and Singh, but Joyce definitely got to Brazil and he, he you know, he, he did something there too. So thank you for that. I think Margaret, does anybody know? Yes, okay, so... Uh... I would add you, yes. Okay, okay, so so we'll talk more um, over lunch, maybe. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>